Okay, well, thanks for um, coming. This is a a talk which builds on a talk which Chris Shaw, who is a member here, gave to the um, Institute of Hydrogeologists um, a couple of years ago now. Uh, I think he was going to give it to you guys, but um, that's now fallen to me, so um, that, that's all good. So let's talk about uh, Lake Wells, uh, which you, some of you may have heard of, some of you may have heard nothing of. Uh, so hopefully we'll find a sweet spot which um, which will be of interest to everybody. Um, Lake Wells, the Australian potash, kicked off in 2015. Uh, before that, uh, the predecessor of Australian potash, Goldfire Resources, was out on the same ground from 2010 to 2014. Um, and the, the exact details of how it moved into a um, potash from gold, I'm not sure. Um, but there must have been um, a reason back in the day when some somebody came up with um, it was a better thing for Lake Wells. So since 2015, the Australian potash team, which was a which is a multidisciplinary team of engineers, geologists, hydrogeologists. Uh, project has proceeded through uh, DFS feed level of assessments uh, and subsequently gone into various um, optimization programs. There's been four major phases of field work since 2015 um, production bore drilling, monitoring bore drilling, uh, tr uh, passive seismic or tremino. Uh, these are just some of the things which have been happening. So we've had major field programs in 2016, 2017. 2019 and then uh, the last one was in 2021 which went into 2022 um, just a general disclaimer um, what as well as the australian potash team we've been um, reliant on the services of various consultants who and uh, who've worked with us on this project uh, the hydrogeological consultant uh, and competence person have uh, been supplied by AQ2 here in Perth. So the format of the talk, we're going to get look at the project location. Uh, what is potash for those who are, might not be aware? Uh, the extraction and the concentration process. Uh, the site sits on an archaean basement, um, sedimentary infill. Um, we're going to touch on the Jork and Brine resources, uh, recent developments, as well as lessons learned associated with the project. Uh, you know, we, I think the whole the four years I've been in Australia in Portage has been a, a lessons learned, and the and the flavour of the team, the flavour of the company is it's we, we're always seeking to learn lessons, and we're also seeking to share those learnings where we can. So the site is located there, almost bang smack in the middle of Western Australia. Uh, we fly into Laverton. Occasionally we've had, had access to uh, nearby pastoralist airstrips, but generally we fly into Laverton and we drive to the site. Um, its remote location coupled with its large site means logistics and communications have been, uh, will and always be um, difficult. Uh, although the site's 200 kilometers long um, and the Paleo Valley is up to 170 meters deep, um, the area in the um, the box here is the is the area is the current area of Australian potash's interest, uh, which covers something like um, 80 kilometers uh, the, uh, the Paleo Valley in that. Uh, Green box is approximately 80 kilometers long. Uh, what's potash? Um, well, it's a source of potassium, uh, high grade fertilizer, uh, potassium, nitrogen, and phosphorus being the three uh, essential nutrients to plant life. Um, we, we are looking to produce SOP, which is a potassium sulfate uh, compound. You might have heard of MOP, which is a potassium chloride compound. But the advantages of SOP over MOP 
um, is uh, no chloride, so less root burn and less chloride buildup in the soil profile. So, you know, it's a high grade fertilizer. Oh, this is just a bit of a light hearted uh, comment here when Matt Shackleton was going off. He, two or three years ago, he was regularly going off to China pre COVID marketing and so on. And this, this appeared in the uh, Western Australian newspaper, which uh, gave the team something to. Uh... Said, stop it, bring that. <laughs> well, yeah, that's well, hopefully. Um, sorry, I should have introduced Rhett here. Rhett Brands is one of our uh, directors of the APC. Uh, had a role, had a stint as the project director for about a year. So <sighs> Rhett knows the project pretty well if you've got any questions later. Um, so this is what um, the site uh, will look like when it's um, constructed. Um, what you see here is the, the planned bore field going through the Paleo Valley. Uh, there are 89 balls, uh, production balls planned in there. At the moment, we've drilled uh, 23, of which some of those will go into the, um, the final mix of these 89, not, not over 23, uh, but some of them. Uh, the balls discharged to these um, ponds here. Um, the, the residence time as the brine goes through these ponds to the process plant is something is the best part of two years, I think. 27, 27 months. Uh, it then goes to this uh, process plant here. Um, and we're looking from there. Um, SOP will be uh, transported off site. Um, by truck um, to, and the aim is 205 um, kilotons per annum of SOP going off the site. So in essence, the Paleo Valley you saw just going through that uh, bore field, um, you could think, you can view it as looking something like this. So at the base of the Paleo Valley, we see remnants of uh, Permian deposits, uh, but the rest of the, um, the infill is, is tertiary age. Um, so it's a multi-layered uh, aquifer system, um, combination of clays, uh, with sand lenses, uh, and with sandy horizons in between. And the, the concept is that the, the sand layers will act as a sump, which will collect brine from the clay layers um, as we pump to surface. Uh, you can see here is the, those, that middle clay layer, which we refer to as a lower aquitard, uh, is something like 100 meters thick. Uh, the basal sands, uh, uh, much less than that. Uh, the upper aquifer, uh, less again. But overall, the scheme, yeah, we go back to what we said before, is we're looking to produce 205,000 tonnes per annum of SOP or fertiliser, pumping hypersaline brine for 30 years uh, at a maximum flow rate in excess of 700 litres a second. Um, the model, we've, mining is from storage, i.e. we're assuming minimal recharge or through flow in the system. Um, we, we view it as a, as a bathtub. <coughs> so first things first, the Archaean basement. Uh, we have been uh, looking at that in the combination, looking at the mapping. Uh, the existing uh, magnetic uh, data. Uh, we've um, drilled bores in the area, um, historical mineral exploration bores from the gold fire resources days, brine exploration uh, bores post 2015, monitoring and production bores has been four phases of that drilling. And in addition to that, we've been doing this passive seismic work. So all of that to uh, delineate 
the Paleo Valley in the Archean Basement. Now that's just a, a dump of the um, paleotopography from the Pasic seismic data. Uh, so if I don't know if people are familiar with that, but it, it's all about um, calibrating that uh, output against uh, known bore depths to generate an acoustic velocity for which they can then calibrate the, their model. So now looking at the sedimentary profile, uh, this is one of our um, diamond holes. And what we have at the bottom here is this is the base of the sedimentary profile. Uh, this is the basement. So what we're seeing here, we believe are these glacial deposits of a Patterson formation, which has a, um, an outcrop some <clears throat> 30 kilometers to the southwest of the site. So that's the Patterson formation there. <clears throat> we then go into the sedimentary uh, profile. Uh, well, there's been all this borehole drilling, some several thousand meters of borehole drilling. Um, We've got 23 brine production bores across the site. Uh, we've also done extensive uh, BMR logging. 19 holes have had BMR, 18 holes have had BMR logging. Uh, there's been hundreds of um, uh, samples for PSD analysis. So what we see here is the, the lower clay aquitard. And what we see here is the uh, basal sand aquifer. Uh, and I can't see those depths, but I think that's something like 150 uh, down to a, down to the bottom of the hole. Uh, you can see the sandy layers, uh, and that's the, the lower clay aquitard. Um, as well as the um, PSD and BMR logging, uh, we've done pumping testing on 21 of the 23 production balls, uh, step rate tests on all of them, um, constant rate tests on all of them. Some of the constant rate tests have varied between approximately 10 hours to in excess of 30 days. Uh, groundwater across the site. This is, this is um, the area of the Paleo Valley. Effectively, it's at shallow depth at or near surface across the salt lakes. Um, and the general flow direction is, for, although it's a relatively flat lying area, there is topography and the general flow direction is from, is from areas of high um, topography down into the Paleo Valley, uh, which is where um, evaporation occurs. Uh, brine, uh, typically hypersaline, elevated TDS in excess of 350,000 milligrams per litre in places, uh, elevated potassium concentrations, uh, three to 5,000 milligrams per litre isn't uh, uncommon. Uh, these are pictures of the uh, chip samples associated with the lower clay. Um, they've probably been in those, um, it's probably been sitting there for a year. We open the chip trays and we can see all this uh, brine oozing out of the clay. Um, so, so the clay layer, the uh, upper and lower aquitards are actually the major source of brine for the project. Uh, and they drain into the um, uh, upper and lower aquifers, as we talked about previously. Uh, within this uh, clay layer, there are many thin sand interbeds. Uh, it's often carbonaceous.
So this um, is our basal sand layer. Um, so zooming in, so oh, coarse sand um, with this uh, carbonaceous material. So here we're talking about the, the Jork um, code, which is um, where AQ2 come in for us. Um, perhaps speaking to the converted here, but um, in terms of satisfying the Jork code for Brian resources, there are two, um, two strands, uh, the collection of um, the evidence and the eventual economic extraction of that material. Um, well, the hard evidence um, in a hydrogeological setting includes the grade of brine. And we just talked about what that is in terms of potassium grade. Um, and then all the um, hydro parameters which we've gathered uh, with the uh, test pumping, the BMR, the PSD work. Um, economic parameters relate to brine grade and pond area. Um, so to prepare that ore reserve, AQ2 have been working on a regional groundwater flow and transport model um, to simulate a whole variety of brine extraction scenarios. Uh, that model has, in my time at APC, has gone through half a dozen iterations as more data has been gathered and it's been fed into it. Mm -hmm. So, um, hard evidence which you where we've been what we've been collecting uh, we've got the uh, basement profile delineated um, we've done all the PSD analysis um, we've done the BMR testing um, hundreds of samples of brine have been analyzed uh, balls have been uh, <clears throat> test bumping has been carried out Then we now get to the nitty gritty, uh, the economics of the project. So this column here, you need to think back to that cross section where we have the, from the basal sand um, uh, up through that uh, cross section. And you can see here that the majority of the uh, ore sits in the clay layers in the lower aquitard and the upper aquitard and that material will be pulled out of the ground uh, by leakage into these uh, sand units, the basal sand and the upper sand. Uh, we're sitting on 18.1 million tonnes of SOP. Um, so our mineral resource estimate is 18.1 million tonnes. Um, and at the moment, uh, AQ2's model is saying over the 30 years of the life of mine, uh, we 3.6 million tonnes will come uh, from all reserve, an additional 1.52 um, will be abstracted from the um, mineral reserves estimate. And what you see here, this is the um, APC company release for uh, 2022. So uh, following the latest phase of work on site in 2021-2022, uh, our productive brine abstraction increased from our previous maximum of 126,000 uh, tonnes per annum SOP. And we're now looking at 135 thousand tons per annum SOP. Uh, people will ask, you know, why are the changes? You know, it's it's where does that good news come from? Well, the previous figure was based on the drilling at that time where we had um, seven production balls. Um, the 2021-22 work um, comprised a further 16 production balls. Um, 
And what we saw from those additional bulls, um, aquifer transmissivities and bull yields were at the higher end of the range previously observed. They didn't go, you know, they, you could relate them to what we'd seen in previous years, but they, all of those bulls were at the higher end. So good news story for APC, I guess. Um, what that work also did, as well as um, increasing the uh, SOP um, pumping rate, uh, it also enabled us to uh, reduce the number of planned bores. Previously, it was 172 bores over the life of mine, pumping 126,000 tonnes per annum SOP equivalent. Uh, um, our most recent model indicates it's not 172 anymore. It can be, it can be as low as 89. And this is the output of the AQ2 model, which the port's at. So what you see here is the, um, so the brown line is the number of balls uh, steadily increasing. And what you can see here is the brine abstraction increases and then starts dropping off at about year 22. And the reason, and then here we've got the potassium grade uh, decreasing. So that decrease in potassium grade is, is offset by that increased pumping rate to maintain that this is our 135 um, our SOP um, target. And what we see is up until about year 22 again, we're either at or above target. And then in year 22, it starts dropping away. Uh, that blue line there is the actual SOP coming out the ground, but um, we factor in a 20% losses, so that blue line becomes that green line. And what you can see there is that maximum pumping rate there uh, is something, so that's seven. So it's in excess of 750 litres a second pumping rate. Uh, starts at um, 650 litres a second. Um, well, we talked about the company's always been um, willing to learn from its lessons and share those learnings. So these are some of the lessons that we've um, taken in the last few years. Um, this again might be preaching to the converted, uh, but it's worth reiterating is, uh, you know, prior to mobilizing all this complicated equipment to site, you know, check what's coming um, before it arrives to avoid unnecessary delays on arrival. And that can be uh, drilling rigs, uh, pumping testing equipment, or anything. You know, um, I think it's, yeah, we've suffered from that. Um, mud rotary is the preferred method of drilling bores at Lake Wells. Uh, although it's time consuming, uh, the potential for abandoned bores and cost overruns, we believe, is, is decreased. Uh, a combination of PVC and stainless steels are pref oddly preferred uh, well construction materials uh, with the stainless steel um, component uh, being optimal, optimal for bore development. Uh, due to the sand interbeds encountered in those clay layers, the final bore design is a compromise between maxim maximizing yields and subsequent development duration, i.e. increased costs. Uh, we have been spending between 10 and 60 hours developing some of our balls. <clears throat> Another thing we need to look at before we go back to site is uh, we, we've seen quite a variation in, in rates of gravel packing and duration of development. Um, and I think there's a discussion to be had there with the contractors to just to rein that in, or at least understand it better why we're seeing that variation. Um, at the moment, you might be aware, we're in an extended period of um, care and maintenance. 
So all the drilling consumables, PVC, stainless steel, muds, um, et cetera, are all stored in these uh, shelters here, uh, ready to be uh, pulled out when we get going again. Um, and I've just taken a liberty of including a few photographs, uh, a wet mess, which I don't think has ever actually been used as a wet mess, but uh, it's never, it hasn't sold anything, but people take their own drinks to site. Uh, that's our dry mess. Uh, and this is just some of the earthworks that we've been doing out on the salt lakes using equipment like this to produce these pads. And to get all of this um, mud rotary equipment on and you know um, all the consumables to get us down to 170 metres, uh, they're, they're quite large areas and we've agreed with the contractors that's a 50 by 50 work area and that um, that seems to have had you know it, it's a good area for them there's, there's been no excuses no complaints about um they're, they're constrained in the, in the working space so really that's just a rattle through australian potash at lake wells uh, and I might have missed information. If you've got any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Rhett's here, you can take them as well. And I'm happy if we don't bottom it out tonight, I can get questions answered for you uh, further down the line. I can give you my email address and we can we can start a conversation.